Chapter 58. An, please like, subscribe, and comment. It really helps my motivation to continue writing this story. Chapter 58. Most of the night that Peter and MJ spent awake was occupied with. Not talking. As soon as they changed from their swimsuits and into sweatshirts and shorts that substituted for pajamas, Peter had wound his arms around Mary Jane's thin waist and hauled her over to the bed, with Mary Jane giggling all the while. That is, until Peter plopped her down flat on the mattress and clanged her mouth. That quieted her laughter down really quick. No, instead, she made the most arousing noises, gasps, moans, groans. Peter soaked in every sound that she made and let it set a match to the fire that was already blazing within him. But all too soon, he found himself drifting off. No matter how hard he tried to fight against it. He was still running off of the lack of sleep that he's been enduring for the past months since he was blipped back into existence. It didn't take long for Mary Jane to notice that there was a distinct slowing down of Peter's ardor. I'm so sorry, Peter mumbled against her lips. It's fine, Tiger, Mary Jane whispered back as she pulled her face away from his. Peter blearily opened his eyes to look at her, even in the muted darkness of the room, he could see her expression was full of nothing but understanding. She furthered this by saying, you're dead exhausted. Get some sleep. But I was looking forward to this. His eyes drooped. Mary Jane giggled at him softly as her fingers went to the hair on his forehead, brushing it back. I'm not going anywhere, Tiger. We will have plenty of other opportunities. His eyes squeezed shut, the strain of keeping them open too much, as he nuzzled his nose against her neck. Promise? He asked sleepily. You have my word was the last thing that he heard before sleep claimed him, his nose shrouded by her scent as it brought a level of comfort as he drifted off into the abyss. In bed, alongside Mary Jane, Peter slept in late for the first time in over a month. And when he woke up, he was more refreshed and awake than he's felt since before the snap. He couldn't believe how such a simple thing as a good night's sleep could impact so much of his cognitive functions. His eyes felt just a tad bit sharper, his senses more acute but the best part of sleeping in late was waking up to find Mary Jane cuddled up next to him. Her arm draped over his chest as she smiled down at him, her red hair cascading as a veil as it surrounded his face. But before they could get carried away, there was a knock on their hotel door. And Peter couldn't even be annoyed because it was Ned. And Peter had asked him to come by last night while they had been at the pool. They sat gathered on the luxurious couch while Peter was quick to catch him up on all that's happened as well as what was about to go down with the fire elemental. Of course, Ned started freaking out about it all, and even tried to apologize to Peter for his part in making everyone agree to stay here in Prague, but it was with the highest gratitude that Peter felt for his longtime friend when Ned readily agreed to help keep everyone away from the center of the festival tomorrow night. When they later met up with everyone at a bistro cafe they agreed upon the night before for a late lunch. Peter could accurately say that it felt good to be on the same page with at least some of the most important people of his life. But the prospect also saddened him as he thought of the others that didn't know his secret. Because he knew that he and Harry would never fully be on the same page. There would always be a bridge that separated them to some degree. And that bridge was made out of a web. Almost as though he subconsciously knew that he was at the center of Peter's thoughts at the moment, Harry chose then to speak up to the chattering group seated at the large round outdoor table. Peter had been glad to see that they were eating outside on the sidewalk cafe, knowing that Mary Jane needed sunshine to get some vitamin D back into her system. Plus, he could see that she was most comfortable now with open, outdoor spaces after being cooped up in a dark room for so long. After the festival, do you all want to take a detour to London? Harry asked as he addressed the group at large, everyone quieted down a bit when he started talking but that immediately reverted back to excitement at the Osborne heir's words, my family owns a townhouse in Mayfair that we can all stay at. I'd love that, Betty exclaimed as she bounced in her chair slightly, oh I've always wanted to see Buckingham Palace in person. Ned looked over and stared at the side profile of Betty's face for a lingering moment before his head snapped back to Harry as he said in a rush, dude, you know I'm there. You know I'm down, too, Flash said, distracted away from his phone for one of the few times that afternoon since he joined them, anything for more content for my followers. The rest echoed their agreements, including Michelle and Brad, but when it got to Peter, he hesitated. I can't, Peter said, thinking of the three-way mobster war that was currently taking place back in New York. He couldn't leave his beloved city defenseless for much longer. Everyone groaned at his response. Even Flash booed at him. 
Peter sighed in the face of their disappointment, before admitting, I have to go back to help Aunt May with our finances. That was also true. He still felt a measurable amount of guilt for abandoning her to have to deal with the ramifications of their sudden blipping back to life. Reaching over, Mary Jane clutched to his hand that had been resting in his lap. She squeezed it once before addressing the group also, and I have to go back with him. My Aunt Anna is probably missing me like crazy by now. They all looked disappointed but understood. Brad especially looked rather sullen which, of course, made Peter all the more gratified by the fact that he and Mary Jane wouldn't be joining them in London after all. The less time that Mary Jane had to deal with the other boys' simpering presence, the better. After that, everyone turned to their meals, chattering away about random things. When, this is bullshit. Flash thundered suddenly down at his phone, causing everyone to jump in their seats, as their attention whipped to him. What is it? Ned asked, his eyes comically wide. Flash looked up from his screen, fire in his eyes. Everyone keeps bashing Spider-Man because he's still missing. Did they ever stop to think that he's got something going on? What if he was gravely injured in the fight against Thanos, huh? Bunch of posers. Pretending to be fans one minute but then they turn on him the next. Peter could only stare on at the other boy with an expansive expression. He always knew that Flash was a fan of Spider-Man, but he hadn't really grasped before just how much of a superfan he really seemed to be. And despite their shared history of Flash bullying him all throughout their school years together, Peter couldn't help but feel gratitude towards him for not caving into the negative talk of Spider-Man from the masses. It showed that Flash actually did have a mind of his own, after all. What are they saying now? Mary Jane piped up with an inquiring look and a cute, little groan as she leaned in closer, her stomach now digging into the edge of the table from the effort. Her hand squeezed his again from underneath the table, a silent way of lending her support. That he's never done anything noteworthy as a hero to begin with. Flash raged fervidly as he too leaned in closer to across the table toward Mary Jane as he disclosed this information with someone he instinctively knew was an ally in his cause. It was strange that they were now commiserating over him. To prove this to be the case, Mary Jane made a disgusted noise that stemmed from the back of her throat. To which Flash animatedly threw his hands up in the air as he exclaimed, I know, right? A bunch of idiots. I mean, they have a bit of a point, Brad chimed in smoothly with a nonchalant shrug as Flash's ire switched to him, Mysterio is way cooler. Harry stayed quiet, but it was clear to Peter that he agreed with that assessment. He just didn't want to audibly agree aloud with something that Brad was saying. Hell, even Peter agreed. Mysterio has already done so much for their world and he's only been here for a month. You're so wrong, man, Flash said, his expression fierce as he jabbed a pointed finger Brad's way. No one could accuse Flash for being a people pleaser, that's for certain. He saved all our lives in DC. Peter blinked. Oh wow. It was so peculiar that he's forgotten all about that, it seemed like a lifetime ago. A different Peter who didn't yet have his spider sense, was trying desperately to prove himself to Mr. Stark, and had a major crush on Liz. It's true, Betty spoke up quietly, her mind lost in the memory of what happened that day. When Peter had rescued them from the falling elevator shaft in the Washington Monument, without him, we would have all died way before the snap. Everyone who had been there that day nodded their agreement with Betty's words, while Harry looked on with a perplexed expression on his face. It was clear that he's never heard of this life-threatening occurrence that had happened in his friends' lives before he was introduced to it. It was definitely a different perception for him, because in his experience, Spider-Man had only ever caused chaos. A moment later, Harry sank back into his chair and donned a contemplative look and Peter couldn't help but wonder what it was that his friend was thinking. But he didn't wonder for long. Because with another squeeze to his hand, his attention was snagged away by his amazing girlfriend, where Mary Jane snuck a secret glance over toward him, brimming with gleaming pride from the tail. Seemingly appeased that he had won the argument, Flash went back down to look at his phone and began scrolling again, when, not even a minute later, he shot up straight in his chair like a bolt before his head whipped around, looking toward the sky in search of something. What is it? Ned asked him, as everyone else looked on, bewildered. Spider-Man was spotted here swinging in Prague. Just yesterday. He's okay. He's alive. Flash enthused before he continued searching the rooftops of the nearby buildings, as though Spider-Man would just be standing there, awaiting discovery. 
All of the color left Peter's face as everyone else exclaimed their surprise before searching toward the skies as well. That is, everyone except for three pairs of eyes that looked to him instead. Mary Jane. Ned, and Michelle Jones. Peter waited until he was relatively alone in their shared hotel room later that evening to finally whip out his phone and look at the headlines for himself. After spending the day sightseeing in Prague with the rest of the group, it had been slowly gnawing at him all day. Now, he could hardly stand waiting until he was able to see it with his very own eyes. They hadn't been able to break away from everyone until Mary Jane declared how exhausted she was from traversing the city streets all day, despite having Peter help her by supporting most of her weight with an arm wrapped around her waist. Everyone easily understood and agreed that it was time for a break, with plans to meet later for dinner and maybe a movie in one of their rooms. But now? Without any lurking eyes to see his inevitable reaction, Peter finally allowed himself to take the plunge as he searched for any mention of Spider-Man in the news and Tilda. Spider-Man on a European vacation in Prague. The webhead was spotted only yesterday swinging through the Czech city. Tilda. Groaning, Peter fell back into the cushion of the couch before he bowed his head, banging his closed fist against his forehead. Everyone thought he was here simply to be on vacation? Hey, stop that, Mary Jane said as she quickly plopped down next to him and coaxed his banging fist away from his head with a bit of effort before Peter relented and allowed her to pull his hand away. Kissing his knuckles, she managed to then unfurl his fist before threading their fingers together. Peter looked up at her, a stricken look on his face. They're saying that I'm here enjoying a vacation. He could only imagine what Jolly Jonah was saying at this very moment. Peter was too afraid to look up the Daily Bugle website right now in order to check, he was not in the right state of mind at the moment to be able to withstand the Jameson shitstorm. It was with a level quietness that Mary Jane had as she looked back at him. How was she acting so calm? Didn't she see how much of a catastrophe this was? How was he going to manage to sway the public back to his side? If Mr. Stark was still alive, he'd. Have you given any more thought on what we talked about? Mary Jane suddenly spoke up, her tone composed, almost tranquil. It was obvious that she was trying to talk him down before he had the chance to work himself up too much, about the social media platforms for Spider-Man? Swallowing, so thick that his Adam's apple bobbed noticeably on his throat, Peter then worried his bottom lip between his teeth. He now understood why she was so at ease with all of this. In her mind, there was a simple solution, where Spider-Man went online and told his side of the events. The idea had merit, Yes, but it felt like such a gamble. What if something happened as a result of it? What if he somehow got hacked past the encryption and someone found out his identity? Or what if it was an issue much simpler than all of that and creating a video was just moot point, because the public's opinion of him was too far gone already? But then? Did it really matter then? Nothing would happen if he did nothing. And if anything, the media's attacks on him would only get steadily worse if something didn't give first especially with J. Jonah Jameson at the helm. Well, um, only a bit, he admitted finally. Mary Jane's brows rose on her forehead as she appraised him, then nodded her head closer in an imploring fashion as she prompted, and? And? Peter drawled, before going on to pointedly state, I know for a fact that I'm definitely not doing TikTok dances. Mary Jane sighed forlornly as she sat back, but there was also acceptance for his decision as she dropped her gaze to her lap. I had a feeling. Hesitating, Peter paused for only a couple of seconds before adding, but. Eyes shooting up, they connected with his, a spark of eagerness in her gaze. But? Peter seriously hoped that he wasn't going to live to regret this. An Instagram account probably wouldn't be terrible, he finally admitted, much to Mary Jane's delight, I could post a video explaining myself like he said. Nodding excessively along to his words, Mary Jane was grinning from ear to ear. Really? We can try it, Peter conceded, giving in to defeat even though this was far from a war. Hell, it may even serve to benefit him in the long run. He was going to trust Mary Jane when she said that it was going to turn out mostly in his favor. Besides, I couldn't possibly tarnish my reputation more than it already has been. Bouncing slightly in her seat, Mary Jane grasped onto his forearms that were resting in his lap. You won't regret it, Tiger. Now, give me your phone while you go fish out your spider suit and... Wait you wanna do this now? He stressed as his eyes nearly bugged out of their sockets. 
The news doesn't sleep for anyone, Tiger, Mary Jane said with a definitive nod, her voice firm, we've already been sitting on this for far too long. But it's not too late to take control of the narrative. You just have to display your openly honest and charming self and the public will adore you. But, I'm not even sure what I should say, Peter exclaimed, anxiety claiming him as it clutched at his heart within its cold grasp. Dread mounted over his head like a wet blanket. What the fuck did he just agree to? Peter, relax, Mary Jane said as she reached out to hold his face in both of her palms, her thumbs ran circles on the apples of his cheeks, this won't be a live recording. We can redo the video if needed. And as for what to say? I think it would be best if you spoke from the heart. Anyone would be able to tell if what you were saying was scripted. Forcing in a deep lungful of air, Peter released it in a shaky staccato. It was so nice to know how much she cared about this, cared about him. She was concerned for Spider-Man's reputation because she saw it as an unfair injustice against his character, meaning that she must perceive him in a very high light indeed. But it wasn't her that Peter had any doubts in. It was himself. Slowly, he leaned into her touch on his cheeks, basking in the warmth she was giving so freely. Peter whispered, How are you so sure that I can do this? Pausing, Mary Jane looked at him seriously for a long, lingering moment. Her green eyes were swimming with such trust and devotion. It was difficult for him to even contemplate looking away first just from how beautiful they were, like emeralds shining in the light of the sun. His breath left him in a rush. It was almost as though she were tearing open the window that had blocked the view to her soul, allowing him free access to see the full splendor and alluring purity within. His heart began to race, his palms perspiring profusely. Never had he ever been able to see a person so clearly before in his life. There was so much goodness within Mary Jane, that was so evident for him to see now, even though he thought that he knew as much already in the past. Only now did he realize how much he took it for granted. He could see now that she was the stable rock that he could stand upon, as he was the same for her in return. That not only were they equally matched in wits and sarcasm, but she was also able to withstand his fits of emotion when things got too difficult, managing to bring a light into his life when the darkness seemed all-encompassing. Mary Jane was his lighthouse, beckoning him to traverse through a safe passage in rough waters. Finally, she broke the silence as she whispered, because there isn't much that I've seen you fail at whenever you gather your courage and rise to the occasion. It was at that moment that he finally knew. Peter was in love with Mary Jane Watson. All right, take seven, and... Action. H.A., everyone. Spider-Man here, Peter said awkwardly from his perch on the blank, white wall, clad in his bright red and blue spider suit. Clinging up on the wall was Mary Jane's suggestion. They needed to give some proof that he was actually Spider-Man and not an imposter while also trying not to give anything away of their current location. It would be a disaster if someone recognized a floral pattern or any other distinct detail that the hotel was known for, therefore doxing his whereabouts for the media to hunt him down with. Swallowing, Peter tried to push past the tightness in his throat before continuing, I, uh, created this Instagram account to help address some concerns that I've noticed have been popping up in the media. Trailing off, he looked to Mary Jane for silent confirmation on how it all sounded so far. Mary Jane nodded encouragingly behind the camera at him, her grin so sweet that it bolstered his confidence. He shivered slightly and continued, I know that my absence has been brought up as a concern. Some people have said that I have been shirking my duties. Others have said that I'm no hero at all. I'll leave that up to you to decide. But I'm hoping that before you do come to a conclusion, that you'll hear me out a bit first. Inhaling a deep breath, Peter prepared to trudge forward, what he would share next would be him disclosing some previously private details that he had only outright shared with May, Mary Jane, and Ned. It was so strange that he was now going to be talking about it with the whole world. Almost immediately after the fight with Thanos. I was recruited for a mission, Peter said, feeling so odd as the secrets tumbled easily past his lips, and I'm currently overseas seeing that mission through. I cannot disclose any details on what this mission is yet. Nick Fury would probably kill him for even saying that much about the mission, just from even hinting that the mission existed in the first place, Fury would see it as a betrayal. But Peter was far from caring at this point. He was already doing Nick Fury a favor. Sometimes Peter needed to set out and do things for himself, too. But I'm asking the public to understand how important this is. And that this isn't permanent. I will be home in New York soon. At least, 
He could only hope. If things went wrong tomorrow night, Peter wasn't sure if he would ever make it home again. But it was good for him to at least pretend that he was going to make it out of the next couple of days alive. I know that my words mean nothing to some people. But I'm hoping that my future actions will prove my worth. Because I'm going to do all that I can to make sure that New York City, my home, is protected. And that includes every person within its borders. Mary Jane's smile was blinding from behind the camera, telling him that he was doing a more than adequate job this time around. So encouraging just from her body language alone. God, he loved her. It was so surreal for him to even think it, even though he wouldn't dare yet say it aloud. No. This was one secret that he would have to keep from her for some time, until he knew for certain that she was ready to hear it. It would just be his Parker luck for him to confess all and terrify her to the point that she distanced herself away from him. Swallowing, he tried to refocus his thoughts. Where was he? Oh yes. Now this next message is not for the public at large, Peter said, his tone plummeting into dangerous territory as he forced himself to remember what had been the cause of all of this strife having to do with his reputation to begin with. Green Goblin? Tombstone? Kingpin? I've heard what you've been putting the good people of New York City through these last five years. And just now? Peter dropped from his position on the wall, standing firm on his two feet as he pointed a threatening finger at the camera. That I'm coming for you. Your reign of terror will end. And you'll be held accountable by the court of law. So I would suggest that you give it up now before it's too late. I've messed with your criminal empires before and I can easily do it again. The effects of the bravado in his tone seemed to impact Mary Jane as she looked at him from beyond the camera lens with heat in her gaze. It was time to wrap this up. I have no further comments on my mission, Thanos, or the Avengers, Peter said, his voice soft but also resolute, T thank you for at least hearing my side. And. Stay safe out there. As soon as Mary Jane lowered the camera lens on his phone, Peter whipped off his mask and asked anxiously, What did you think? I think I still sounded too awkward. Before he was even done speaking, she was shaking her head. On the contrary, I think it made you sound more genuine. Like it wasn't rehearsed. Despite her reassurances, Peter began to pace as his hand came up to knot in his hair. Did you think any part of it was too much? I got a bit terse there when I was talking to the Three Stooges. She let out a soft giggle at his description of the crime lords as she shook her head again. Not at all. I think it will reassure the public that you're going to have it handled soon. Pausing in his pacing, Peter whirled about to face her, suddenly needing her strength. But. What if I can't do it? What if I can't defeat them, MJ? Expression softening, Mary Jane took several steps forward until she was standing right before him and cupped his cheek. Her touch was so warm. Soft. He was so tempted to just simply close his eyes and bask in it. I have faith that you will. Have a bit of faith in yourself too, all right? Peter nodded, even though he didn't really feel it fully, but he felt marginally better than he had been feeling before from her words. He had no doubt that prolonged exposure to all things Mary Jane would set his anxiety straight with time. She was just that good with her reassurances. So much so that Peter easily fell into her embrace. It felt like coming home. After some thorough review of the video, they decided that it was ready to post. Creating the Instagram account didn't take long. Peter decided that it would be best if the account didn't follow anyone, apart from Antman Scott Lang, who was the only Avenger that even had an Instagram account. Unsurprisingly, the username, at Spider-Man was already taken by a fan account. So they had to settle for, at real Spider-Man. As for the profile picture? They both decided that it would be seen as less vain if they used a picture of his spider insignia rather than Peter posing for a picture in his mask. It was very important to Peter that this wasn't seen as clout chasing for Spider-Man, it was all strictly informative. A way to reach back out to the people. Are you ready? Mary Jane asked, seeming to wait on bated breath for his answer as she reached over with her free hand to squeeze his thigh, her other hand holding his phone, her thumb hovering over the post button. It took a moment, and after a steadying breath, Peter finally said, post it. Mary Jane nodded, pressed the button, and... It was done. Peter made sure to shut off his phone then, unable to quite bear seeing the response to his video just yet. Mary Jane was all things encouraging, assuring him that all would be well, but she also sensed that he needed a distraction. 
So, like the amazing girlfriend that she was, she pushed him lightly on his chest so that he plopped down on the couch where she proceeded to climb onto his lap and kiss him senseless, making Peter wonder how it was such a mystery to him before on whether he was in love with her or not. His past self was an idiot. Of course he loved this amazingly wonderful girl. Honestly, how could he not? She was his everything. Unfortunately, time managed to find a way to catch up to them once more when their presence was once again requested for their dinner outing with the group. They chose an authentic Czech restaurant that looked to be at least four-star quality, but Harry had insisted. Urging the group by stating that he was buying. Of course, Harry found a seat next to Michelle at one end of the table as he held out the chair for her. But Peter wondered at her actions as he watched as she hesitated, peeked up at him for a mere second, before snapping her gaze away and taking her seat. Frowning, he couldn't help but question what that had been about. But it quickly left his mind when he felt Mary Jane's touch on his shoulder. Turning to look at her with a grin, Peter had shifted his chair so that it was close enough to Mary Jane's to the point where their thighs could touch. He just couldn't get enough of feeling her closeness. Especially now that he knew the true extent of his feelings for her but he was surprised to find himself thoroughly distracted away from the lovely redhead by Flash of all people, who sat down in front of all of them with the widest, shit-eating grin he has ever seen on the other boy's face. And Peter has known him for years now at this point. It didn't take long to find out what had Flash feeling so self-satisfied as he went into detail about how Spider-Man had created an Instagram account and that he posted a video that perfectly explained away everything that the media had accused him of. Underneath the table, Mary Jane reached for his hand and squeezed it tight, and he knew that it was her silent way of celebrating. But Peter couldn't help but think it was slightly premature. It was clear at this point that Flash was biased when it came to Spider-Man. I was one of his first 100 followers. Flash beamed with pride, as he puffed out his chest, as though this were some grand achievement, I've already sent him, like, 20 DMs. At this, Betty snorted. He probably won't respond, Flash. But Peter was surprised once again as he watched as Flash shrugged, not seeming to care. I figured that he couldn't. But I thought that my messages would make him feel good after all of the hate he's been getting. Dude needed to know that he still has real fans out there. The day passed by much too quickly for Peter's liking. As what would come to pass tomorrow night was suddenly back to the forefront of his mind. His anxiety of the impending elemental attack was paramount. So much so, that despite his previous night's rest, Peter found himself lying awake for a good majority of the night as Mary Jane slumbered peacefully next to him, tucked into his side. For the life of him, he just couldn't turn his brain off, endlessly thinking and dissecting his role in what was to come. By the time daylight greeted them, Peter felt more zombie than human. And the hours of the day wild themselves away in a blur as he walked around with his mind seemingly made of mush. More than one of his friends asked if he was all right, which he would simply give a tight smile in return as he nodded at them. Mary Jane seemed to know better, as every so often she would bring their threaded fingers up to her lips where she would kiss the back of his hand. As the evening drew in close, Peter turned more retrospective and somber. It was nearly time. Like a mantra, he recited Uncle Ben's words about responsibility in his mind. Already outside, they were beginning to open carnival booths and start up rides for the festival, and the crowds were starting to pile in. His friends were anxious to begin scouting out the festivities as well. And it was just as twilight was on the horizon when they departed their hotel as a group and began to explore. Peter really tried his best to pretend like he was enjoying himself. It was only with Mary Jane's assistance that he was even able to do so, because for her part, she played the role exceedingly well. Every so often, she would point out something excitedly as she tugged on Peter's arm. She even coerced him into buying some cotton candy for the two of them to share. It was a very clear effort on her part to help ease the obvious tension within him, and he appreciated her attempt. In fact, he loved her for it. Eventually, Mary Jane got the cue from Peter and she spoke up to address the group, stating that she and Peter wanted to go off and be alone for a while doing coupley things. That got a smirk and a waggle of eyebrows directed his way from Harry, while Brad looked on at the two of them together and glowered. Peter couldn't even be bothered to feel justification at triumphing over Brad once again, that was how bad the mounting dread felt within him. Still, as Peter slinked off with Mary Jane in tow, he was gratified to hear as Ned exclaim that there was something that he was interested in seeing on the outskirts of the festival. They were all playing their roles well. Nearing their hotel, Peter diverted them so that they both stepped into an alleyway near it, 
Mary Jane made a point of halting their progress once they were enclosed safely within the shadows as she turned toward him and crushed him close, grasping tightly to the fabric of his shirt at his back. Her voice was thick with tears that she didn't want to shed, be safe. Emotion, so deep and overwhelming, rushed over him as he clung to her form back just as desperately. He didn't want to let go. Peter could tell her. The last remaining secret that he was actively keeping from her. He could tell her right then that he was in love with her. But. He found that something was still holding him back from saying the words. Blame it on the constricting of his throat, or how the words would sound so final as they passed through his lips rather than laced with the genuine affection that he felt for her. It would be apparent for her to think that his declaration of love was only in response to the impending disaster. So instead he swallowed the words similar to how he pictured swallowing a rock would feel like, before he said simply, but not with any lacking of emotion, I will. They drew back from their hug just enough to kiss one another, and it was bittersweet. Because despite his earlier wishes, it still felt like a premature goodbye. Still, he basked in the feeling of her kiss, trying to will the feeling of her lips so that it burned into his memory. When he finally pulled away, taking a step back, he took a moment to let his eyes roam her features, her form, wanting this moment to last for an eternity. She flashed him a wan smile, trying oh so valiantly to be brave for him even as her eyes watered. She looked so beautiful. Go get him, tiger. As per usual, she knew just the sort of thing to make him feel somewhat better, and ever so slightly, a corner of his lips quirked upward. Swallowing thickly, he said as his parting words to her, get somewhere safe. He waited until he got her confirming nod before he crouched down low and launched himself up high into the air, easily making it over the ledge of the rooftop of the nearby building. There, he began to strip himself of his clothing, revealing the spider suit underneath before donning his gloves and mask. As soon as the tight fabric was over his head, his calm showed that he was online and Fury was immediately talking in his ear. I was beginning to think that you weren't going to show, Parker, Fury said in a light tone that most definitely didn't fit the somber mood. Huffing, Peter chose to ignore that comment as he said in response, I'm getting into position. What's Mysterio's status? He's doing a sweep of the area while going incognito, just making sure that everything is in order and nothing is in place that would be a detriment to our goal. Fury paused then, before adding on, you want to tell me what that video was all about that you posted online? What? You didn't like it? Peter asked, his voice dripping with derisive sarcasm as he settled his clothing in a jumbled heap in the corner of the rooftop, was it the angles that upset you? Or the fact that the camera tends to add 10 pounds? Don't be a smartass, Fury warned, his voice testy, dangerous, you could have caused some serious problems and compromised the mission. In what way? Peter asked as he leapt from the building to covertly sneak toward the center of the festival, does the Elemental have an Instagram account that would have warned it of our impending counterattack? No. But you could have caused a panic. Dread washed over him like an ice-cold wet blanket. He hadn't considered that. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Then, I'm sorry, sir. I. I guess I wasn't thinking that far. He heard as Fury let out a long, drawn out sigh. We were able to contain it. Just. Don't act so rashly without consulting us first. So he had to ask permission to do things now, huh? Peter gritted his teeth and chose not to respond at all. Instead, he focused on maintaining his breathing as he secretly leapt from rooftop to rooftop attempting to keep a cool and level head as he got closer to his position. As he steadily got closer to what was to be his watchtower, a new voice came on over his comms. Good luck out there, Spider-Man, Beck's smooth and calm voice rang out through his earpieces, and at the sound of his voice, the tension inside of Peter's chest eased measurably. With Mysterio confirmed to be on the case, there was no way they could lose. The man was just too competent to lose. Mysterio would certainly claim victory this day. Thank you, Peter said back in a rush as he leapt across the final gap between buildings, you too, Mysterio. Sticking to the brick wall of the tower, Peter climbed upward until he was tucked away in an alcove in the shadows, hidden from the mass public below that knew nothing of what was to come. Putting a hand to his ear, he stated in a clear voice, I'm in position. Good, came Fury's ever commanding tone, keep a watchful eye out for any unusual activity. Peter nodded to himself but didn't say anything further, just leaned his back against the rough brick of the tower, 
wanting so desperately to close his eyes and meditate until he was at a state of tranquility. But that would defeat the whole purpose of him being the stakeout for the monster's first appearance. Minutes passed. Periodically, Peter would check the time to ensure that they were roughly on schedule. They hadn't been able to pinpoint the exact time that the fire elemental would show up, but they narrowed it down so that it was close enough. Finally, after 17 minutes of waiting, Peter sat up abruptly as he noticed steam rising up from the fountain in the middle of the square. Energy spiking? Fury proclaimed through his earpiece. We have seismic activity, Maria Hill confirmed. Peter watched with ever-widening eyes as lava began to slither out from the ground as it cracked and broke apart, filtering through the cement as it came up to wind its way around the fountain as though the lava were a sentient snake. Then, boom. The fountain exploded into a rainfall of fire. And beyond the blaze, the form of the fire elemental appeared, roaring at the screaming crowd as they scrambled to get away. Okay, he's here. Peter confirmed, his voice edging on frenzy as he rushed to the edge of the tower, about to leap off, before he remembered himself and he was reminded of the plan, Beck? You ready? You know what to do? On your lead, Spider-Man, Beck verified through his earpiece, letting Peter know that he was nearing the impact site. The fire elemental began smashing everything within its reach. Destroying so much rich culture and history with one fell swoop of its fiery fist. That was the exact moment when Mysterio finally arrived, landing on the pavement several yards away from the monster's feet with his globed helmet securely in place. Green mist began to release from his hands intermix with shrouded symbols as he grunted out in a strained voice, You're up, kid. At the confirmation, Peter launched himself out into the air, webbing himself across the fire elemental's path as he attached himself to the nearest building. Then, secure in his placement on the wall, Peter shot a web at the fire hydrant nearest to the fire elemental at the same exact moment that Mysterio shot green cosmic energy at the beast. Their combined efforts created a large cloud of dark smoke that wafted into the sky in billowing heaps. But of course, things could never be that easy. Not for Peter. He hadn't even the chance to celebrate from his putting out the fire of the monster before it stood up straight again, emerging with a roar. The fire elemental stood from the midst of the smoke and lunged a giant, fiery fist at the exact spot that Peter was situated. Diving, Peter performed a graceful backwards flip in the air as he launched himself off of the building like a dive board, avoiding what could have likely been a brutal blow, one that could have ended his life. The building now had a large, gaping hole in its structure, outlined by a ring of fire and smoke. Peter landed on the tented roof of the carousel as it continued its lazy spin, and he whipped his head around, trying to get his bearings on what exactly he was standing on. When he looked up, his spider sensed tingling, and immediately staggered back as the fire elemental attacked once again. Lava shot everywhere, the impact of the blast sent Peter hurtling through the air as he landed on his back and rolled in a tumbled heap until he collided with the base of the nearby ferris wheel. His breath left him in a whoosh. Pain struck him only a moment later, delayed by the adrenaline that was coursing through his veins. Peter fell forward to his knees, heaving, having had the wind knocked out of him. Before he forced his head upward and gazed on at the monster in horror. No. Beck. He's got the carousel. He's getting bigger, Peter cried as he watched the monster ingesting the metal that the ride was structured with as it absorbed the element through his fingertips, growing larger. Spider-Man. A frantic voice suddenly called from above, Spider-Man, help. The voice cut into his horror-struck gaze, just from how out of place it sounded with the screaming going on in his head. Wah? Peter's head turned back as it snapped upward and all of the color drained out of his face. Because up there, sitting in the cart positioned at the top of the Ferris wheel, sat Betty and Ned. What the fuck were they doing here? He thought that Ned knew to keep them away. We're stuck, Betty cried, relief flooding her face as she realized that they had managed to garner his attention her usually sweet voice now frenzied with distress as her arms waved about wildly in the air. A roar then resounded and Peter turned to see that the fire elemental now stood tall, having grown several feet higher as he took a menacing step toward Peter. And the metal ferris will that stood behind him. Panicking, Peter instinctively lifted both hands and shot two webs at the monster from his wrist but they immediately burned up from the impact. Dread washed over him. Apparently, the heat from the monster was too much for his heat-resistant webs to handle as it stomped ever closer. Raising a fiery fist high in the air, the beast was about to pound down on Peter with all of its might. No. 
A voice cried from his left, just a moment before Mysterio leapt in front of him, taking a protective stance as a shield of green energy protected the both of them from the brunt collision of the giant blundering fist. But the monster didn't stop at just one blow. It kept delivering hit after hit after hit. Are you okay? Beck cried out toward him as they stood side by side, with Mysterio actively protecting them with his energy shield while Peter stood there, useless, his arms scrambling about in the arm with a need to do something. Yeah, Peter shouted back, his voice dripping with his desperation as his mind scrambled for a way out of this. Going to plan B? Mysterio asked him, his voice strained from the effort it took to keep up the shield against the brutal onslaught. Yeah, Peter said again as he started looking around, we gotta hit it with something it can't absorb. There was debris sitting all around now from the monster's rampage against the buildings. If Peter could get his hands on a large chunk of concrete. I go left, you go right. Quentin ordered back at him, and Peter was glad for the command, just so that he had a clear directive on what to do, but he wasn't exactly prepared to follow through with it as Mysterio cried out, now. With an extra jolt to his cosmic power, Beck shot the green energy at the monster just at the same moment he flew off to the left. The monster stumbled back from the fur only a second, and immediately was distracted by Mysterio's flying off in the air, its fiery gaze following it, before it slowly turned to face Peter. Who was still standing there? Taking an advancing step, the monster released a jet of fire from both arms Peter's way, as Peter immediately turned on his heel and ran from the blast, dodging various debris as he looked for anything to attach a web to. Once close enough to a building, he shot a web and used it to propel himself up in the air so that his feet could stick against it. But the billowing wall of fire just kept coming after him as Peter ran with all his might up the structure. If he didn't move now, it would catch up to him. Deciding on a dime, Peter pushed off from the wall, flipping off of it so that he cascaded over the wall of fire that had been advancing on the spot he just vacated. It was as he was soaring through the air when a large chunk of boulder-sized debris caught his eye. Heart soaring at the sight, glad that he now had something to do, Peter shot out a web that immediately attached to a block of concrete, using its taut string to pull it back so that it hit and impacted with the monster's fiery stature. The monster gave a grumbled cry as it staggered back a couple of steps. Okay, Peter cried as he saw Mysterio hovering close by behind him, shoot him. Mysterio shot past Peter like a rocket in the sky, both hands extended as bolts of green energy came out of them as it collided with the monster. As Mysterio shifted course in the air, trying to avoid crashing into the fiery beast, Peter was gratified to see a large gaping hole in the monster's chest, outlined with the green smoke of Mysterio's cosmic energy. But the monster still stubbornly stood tall. Spider-Man! Keep your distance, Mysterio cried out in his earpiece, alerting Peter that he should zip away. Peter shot a web as he did exactly what Mysterio commanded. I'm trying, Peter exclaimed. We can't let him get near the Ferris wheel. Beck directed, his voice just barely edging on frantic. All of the color left Peter's face again as he was reminded of the Ferris wheel. Where his two friends sat in a precarious situation. Okay. I'm on it. Peter changed course, zipping through the air as he attempted to get to the fair ride as quickly as he could, but a fiery fist slammed into him sending Peter hurtling until he collided with an electrical box that had been used to power the rides. Electricity coursed through his body as he was zapped for a few seconds before he fell flat onto his stomach on the ground. Then, with a horrific, guttural cry, the elemental brought its clenched hand up into the sky before driving it down to the ground. The earth shattered, breaking into jagged lines of lava that was ever-expanding. Until it reached the ferris wheel. Peter watched with nothing short of terror as the ferris wheel started to tip forward into the newfound gap that was created in the ground. Ned and Betty's screams resounded in his ears as they scrambled to stay in the ride, very nearly toppling over the edge. Their screams garnered the attention of the monster as it once again noticed the precious metal of the ride that they sat upon. Taking two giant footsteps, the monster outstretched its fiery hand, reaching for it, but then Mysterio was before it blasting the monster with so much energy that it couldn't help but pause in its advance. Both of the powerful beings struggled for dominance and Peter saw this as an opportunity to jump in and save his friends with the monster distracted. Jumping to his feet, Peter ran the short distance needed to get to the ride structure, desperate to get there quickly as he reached up and shot out a web. Only it didn't attach to the ferris wheel like he had been intending. Instead, it bounced and ricocheted off of nothing but thin air before the web disappeared a distance behind him. 
Peter didn't think anything of it, didn't have time to. His mind was bustling with desperate worry for his friends as he redoubled his efforts in trying to save them. Taking a giant leap in the air, Peter flipped once acrobatically as he positioned himself to hurtle through the beams of the Ferris wheel, firing out lines of webbing as he went along as he attached one end to the nearest building and the other to the carnival ride to prevent it from tipping over. But he didn't stop at just one web line. He kept shooting more and more just so there would be extra support for the circular structure. Just then, while he was busy securing the safety of his friends, two black cars drove up with official government license plates, and out stepped Nick Fury and Maria Hill as they watched the action with wide eyes. Flipping to the opposite side of the Ferris wheel, Peter stuck his feet to the metal beams while keeping a firm grasp on a line of his webbing, trying to use himself as a tether now to keep everything in place. Over his shoulder, he saw that Mysterio was still fighting the elemental with jets of green light, administering a particularly powerful blast at the beast that sent the monster staggering back a step. Hope fluttered in his chest as he watched on, all while holding onto his web line with all his might. That's IT. Peter praised, as another blast from Mysterio sent the titan tottering backward a few more steps, nice. You got him. But Mysterio's blasts ended up being too powerful. As it sent the monster toppling back into a large structure of metal scaffolding that had been being used for a construction project. Upon touching the beast's skin, the fire immediately absorbed the metal as the elemental grew to unstoppable heights. A large gasp escaped him at the dreadful sight, unable to comprehend in his mind yet of what exactly just happened. No, 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 Mysterio cried out, with dread so acute in his tone of voice that it was evident to Peter that the latest outcome of this scenario had led them to a place that was now completely out of their control. Beck doubled his efforts in blasting cosmic energy at the monster, but the elemental was now undeterred by it as it took a hefty swipe in the air at Mysterio that the man just barely dodged. Then, the monster stood tall and reared its head back as it roared in triumph up at the night sky. Time seemed to crawl then. Mysterio now hovered in front of Peter as he slowly turned his head back to look at him. The globed helmet disintegrated back into mist, revealing Quentin Beck's beaten face that was riddled with despair. Eyes locked with Peter's lenses as the man, the hero, before him panted heavily. Whatever happens, Quentin said directly to Peter, I'm glad that we met. It took a second for the words to register in his mind as Peter continued to hold the line of webbing with all his might. But it suddenly clicked in his brain just as Quentin turned his face away from Peter. To face the fire elemental once again. Beck what are you doing? Peter nearly screamed, watching as the domed helmet reappeared to protect Mysterio's head from harm. What I should have done last time. Came his definitive response before his body seemed to draw inward, drawing so much power and green energy to him as his very being consumed it all. Ghastly screams of absolute agony escaped his ally, his friend, then as Peter could only look on in terror. Was he he couldn't possibly? But no. No. In an instant, it was all made abundantly clear to Peter what exactly the Universal Traveler's plan was. Mysterio was sacrificing himself. Beck. Peter screamed helplessly, don't do it. There was nothing that Peter could do. If he let go of the tether to help Beck, then Ned and Betty. They would fall to their depths. Glowing with crackling green energy, Mysterio lunged himself forward in the sky, flying at such a speed, that he was nothing more than a green blur to Peter's eyes, where he aimed his whole body at the monster like a missile, plunging himself into the elemental's chest. No. Peter wailed with absolute desperation and anguish as immediate tears sprung to his eyes beneath the mask. A large gaping hole outlined with charred green appeared as it ate away at the form of molten lava. Beck. Cosmic green spread over the creature like it was being overtaken by a deadly disease. Shakily, the monster reached out a hand in a last attempt to save itself by touching the metal of a ferris wheel. But at a burst of green light, the fire elemental exploded before it even had the chance. Specks of ash rained down from the sky as an overwhelming quiet took over what had previously been blaring noise. With the ground no longer shaking, and therefore stable, Peter shot several more web lines to secure the ferris wheel in place. Then, as the dust began to settle, Peter spotted a lone figure lying face down on the ground, unmoving as it was surrounded by debris. In a gasp, his breath left him as Peter jumped from his vantage point and landed on nimble feet before he immediately took off running toward the body of the man he has grown to admire so much in such a short amount of time. This couldn't be happening. Not again. 
His cursed presence had somehow managed to claim yet another victim just because he had dared to get close to Peter. Peter could have done so much more. He could have found a different path. Found a way to save him. He could have. His thoughts cut off as he came upon Mr. Beck's still form, only. He swore that he saw movement coming from his chest. A seed of hope dared to be planted in his mind as he knelt down next to the man, his hand tentatively reaching out to touch his shoulder. Mr. Beck? Slowly, Peter turned his friend over so that he was now face up on his back, only to find Quentin with some nasty burns and scrapes on his face as he panted to get a breath in, but the only thing that mattered was that he was alive. Relief, a consuming in its sweetness, spread throughout his entire body. His shoulders sagged with the release of tension as he hovered over the man's form. Oh, thank God. Peter nearly sobbed as Beck held out a hand for Peter to grasp, which he readily did, before pulling up the man to unsteady feet. Then, in a fit of emotion, Peter lunged forward and wrapped his arms around Beck as the man staggered back from the sudden onslaught. But Peter made sure to keep him upright. It was with painstaking slowness that Quentin Beck raised his arms to hug Peter back. An hour had passed with relative quickness as S.H.I.E.L.D. agents swept the area. Dr. Leslie was on site, inspecting Mr. Beck for any serious injuries as he sat upon a level pile of debris. It was only after she gave the green light, that he seemed to be okay apart from being slightly battered, where the Inquisition began. They questioned Mr. Beck on different parts of the battle, on what had occurred, who did what, and so on. Eventually, Maria Hill asked him a question with a slight tinge of hope lacing her voice, so, it's over? That was the last of them, Quentin confirmed, looking thoroughly exhausted as sweat still dripped from his brow, not even looking up as Nick Fury paced in front of him. But not the last threat that we'll ever face, Fury said with an ominous air before he turned to face Beck fully, we need to stay vigilant. Measurably, Quentin finally began to look up at the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. as the man continued speaking. There's a void in this world for someone like you. Hill and I are going to Europol headquarters in Berlin tomorrow. You should join us. An expression that could only be described as a man that always accepted full responsibility crossed Mr. Beck's features as he stood up from the rubble he had been sitting upon, looking Fury right in the eye as he shook his hand. Thank you. I just might take you up on that. Peter watched all of this occur from a short distance away, suddenly feeling like the outlier in a much grander operation. Seeming to sense this as well, Fury turned to look at him while Beck gingerly took his seat again, the director of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s eye narrowed with disappointment as he took the several steps needed to get to Peter, only stopping when he stood right before him. As he approached, Peter couldn't help but bow his head slightly in shame. Because as they all listened to Quentin recall the events of the fight, there really hadn't been much that Peter had done to positively impact anything. He had just been a distraction for Mysterio, mostly, one that needed saving from being slammed with a fiery fist for at least two occasions. You've got gifts, Parker, Fury finally said, his voice low and full of a level of regret, but you didn't want to be here. Mr. Fury, I Peter tried to interrupt to apologize for not doing enough, for nearly getting Mysterio killed when the hero tried to sacrifice himself in order to protect him. It's clear that you still have some growing up to do, Fury continued on as though he hadn't hurt Peter, and that can happen under my guidance if you would only allow it. Now, if that is something that you want, I would love to have you in Berlin too. But you've got to decide if you want to step up or not. The firmness of his tone only made Peter want to wallow in his shame even more. Stark chose you. He made you an Avenger. I need that. The world needs that. But it seems to me that all you want to do is throw all that away. Fury broke off with a regretful sigh, maybe Stark was wrong. Tears swam in Peter's eyes as he was met with a full onslaught of these words. Then, tilting his head with a significant look at Peter, Fury said with a note of finality, was he? The choice is yours. Leaving Peter with a hollow feeling in his chest, Nick Fury took slow steps away from him, letting the uneasy sensation he left wallow behind as it festered and grew. As Nick Fury turned his back on Peter, he could see out of the corner of his eye that Mysterio was watching him with measurable silence, studying Peter. There was no sympathy in his gaze, nor empathy. Just pure and simple understanding as he rose from his seat once again and approached him as Peter shifted on uneasy feet, feeling awkward and knowing that someone as amazing as Mr. Beck had been witness to Peter's humiliation. He thought that maybe Beck would say something profound. Hell, maybe even chime in with his own criticisms on Peter's lack of true help in the fight. But no. 
Instead, he paused right beside him, just long enough to pat Peter on the shoulder as he said in a gruff and tired voice, Let's get a drink. Peter blinked. Not quite grasping the words. Then, Mr. Beck continued walking as though he fully expected Peter to follow. Whirling around, Peter watched Beck's retreating back as he replied in a shaky tone, I'm not 21. With one hand nursing his beer, Beck clapped the other on his shoulder and squeezed it gently. They were sitting in a local tavern bar that had a cozy atmosphere that seemed to intermix nicely with the Czech culture. They had been silent apart from ordering their drinks. Peter just wasn't really sure what to say. Or where to even begin to apologize for his lack of ability to stop the monster. Mr. Beck had counted on him and Peter had let him down. And that was nearly at the cost of Beck's life. Hey, Beck tried to coax as Peter cradled a glass of lemonade with both hands. The man's voice was gentle, reassuring, as he went on to say, you gotta celebrate. We did something good tonight. Yeah, Peter murmured quietly, not really believing it of himself but he was too tired to argue with Mr. Beck. Sniffing once, Peter scratched at the bridge of his nose. He was hunched over the table of the bar, both of his hands now clenching at his glass of lemonade. Fury was right, Peter finally confided aloud, admitting to his failures, and Mr. Stark did a lot for me. So. I owe it to him, to everybody. Beck was turned fully in his seat now, facing Peter as he gave him a concerned and incredulous look, do you? Peter blinked. Yeah, I mean. Breaking off, Peter straightened his posture as he glanced over at Beck, Mr. Stark. Gave me the chance to be more, wanted me to be better than him. Fury just wants me to live up to that. What do you want, Peter? Quentin interrupted in a sudden burst. Eyebrows furrowing, Peter looked over at him. What do you mean? What do you want? Beck pressed, more insistently. Peter scoffed, shifting uncomfortably in his seat from the sudden inquisition. I, uh, I don't know. What do you want? You. Peter Parker, right now, Quentin said in a rush, I know you're thinking about it. I just want to go home, Peter blurted out in a scramble with his haste to get the words out, I want to spend time with my amazing girlfriend without getting interrupted all the time. I want to help my Aunt May with our financial burdens back home. And I want to be a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man again, not a full-time Avenger. I was always at my best when I fought petty-level crime. And I'd like to get back to that. Eyes lingering on him for a lingering beat, Beck studied him. But you're not going to do that, are you? No, I can't. Why not? Because I have too much of a responsibility. Beck gave him a look before he said pointedly, a responsibility you don't want to have. Peter sighed before answering honestly. No. No, I don't. At least. Not one so big. It was as Peter took another long sip of his lemonade where Beck continued to stare at the side profile of Peter's face for a long moment. Peter couldn't help but wonder if Beck was casting judgment for Peter's lack of integrity on this issue. Uncle Ben would certainly be ashamed of him for even considering taking a step back. But Peter was so tired. And he desperately needed to get back to a world that held sanity and a semblance of the reality that he was used to. And he knew that he would find that back in New York. It took a long moment, but finally, Beck spoke. You know. In my universe, I was deemed one of the strongest heroes. Not so different from your Iron Man, actually. Blinking rapidly, Peter tried to fight against tears at the mention of the name of Mr. Stark's alter ego. And he wondered when it would stop hurting so much to think of the man. Or rather. If it would ever stop. But what I've come to find out over the years, while working with others, is that some are born leaders, while others. Work better just following the other's lead. Swallowing thickly, Peter could only bow his head as his hands folded awkwardly in his lap. Sensing Peter's sudden discomfort, Beck rushed to explain, and there's no shame in that. There's a reason why humanity works so well with a hierarchy system. You see it in the military, police force. Even in everyday society with the concept of manager and employee. Even while one person is essentially in charge of the others, it doesn't mean that they are looked down on or deemed as lesser than. Everyone is just one part of a well-oiled machine. Only. That machine only needs one operator. Hesitating, Peter thought over Mr. Beck's words very seriously. How he described it made it sound so clear for Peter for the first time since he's been bitten by that spider. Perhaps. 
He could dare to hope that he wasn't cursed and was instead taking initiative in his superhero life when he had no right in doing so. Since the beginning, all that he had wanted to do was for Mr. Stark to give him a chance. But as soon as he did, Peter had messed up on numerous occasions. And it even led to Mr. Stark's ultimate demise. So why was he even contemplating becoming a full-time Avenger when it was abundantly clear that he wasn't made for that sort of life? Peter could now clearly see it, he was never meant for the big-time hero stuff. That was precisely the reason why he hadn't been able to save Mr. Stark. No. It was better for everyone if he accepted his true role in life, which was fighting for the little guy. And it was as he thought this, a semblance of peace washed over him. Yeah. This felt like his right course. Honestly. That kinda makes sense, he finally said aloud. You think so? Peter nodded. Yeah. If everyone was a leader, then. No one would be. And. I'm honestly not sure that I'm cut out for it. Trying to give Peter a reassuring look, Quentin said, I'm sure with some time and practice, that you'll. No. It's not just that. Sighing deeply, Peter set out to try again, I think that some people are just born to lead and some are born to follow. I was never meant to be the leader type. Me getting bit by that spider was all a fluke, simple luck that it happened to choose me. Without that dumb luck, I wouldn't be in the position to be making any choices like this in the first place. I wouldn't have even met Mr. Stark and gotten close enough to get the glasses handed to me after he was. Gone. Hell, if it had been someone else that the spider chose to bite instead of me, that person probably would have been able to save him. Immediately, Mr. Beck was shaking his head, absolute denial in his expression, you can't blame yourself for what never happened. Truth is, you are a hero. Just. He broke off, hesitating, as though he wanted to weigh his words carefully before he spoke them, not a hero that is meant for such a large scale. You said it yourself. You're so much happier when you fight petty level crime. I think that's the life you are meant to focus on. And you can leave everything else up to me. It was a bittersweet discovery. To find out that he had been retroactively right all along when he had denied Mr. Stark's offer to be an Avenger all those years ago to look out for the little guy. But at the same time, it was also crushing a long-time dream that he's had since he was a boy, where he would believe with childlike wonder that one day, he, Peter, would fight alongside the Avengers. But he's already lived that dream. And now? He had a new one. One that involved not traveling the world on Nick Fury's whim. One that contained stability. Routine. One that included the girl that he loved. Peter sniffed once, both basking and mourning his decision. The only painful part of this was that he knew that if Mr. Stark could see him now, he would be disappointed in him. It's just so crazy. How much Fury expects from you? You're still just a 16-year-old kid. Peter nodded to himself. Sometimes he forgot that he was still just a teenager himself. Yeah, I know. A 16-year-old kid that deserves to live his life, Beck continued, to help his aunt with chores, not finances. Kiss his girlfriend and also plan to take her on many dates, including the prom that Fury likes to bring up so much. Peter cracked a smile at that. It sounded like such a nice dream. One that he desperately wanted to make a reality. Mary Jane was bound to look stunning in a prom dress. Suddenly, a woman tapped him on the shoulder before she bent down to pick up an object that had been sitting on the floor next to his feet, speaking Czech in a friendly manner as she handed him a pair of glasses. Peter's eyes widened as he paled slightly. Oh my god. Thank you so much, he managed to breathe out his gratitude as he reverently took the glasses into his hand. How had they managed to end up on the floor? They had been in the hidden compartment of his spider suit. And he had since put on his civilian clothes over it. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw that Quentin's expression was wide and bewildered as he witnessed the exchange, not even glancing at the woman as she walked away. Instead he stared heavily at the object in Peter's hands. W.H. What are those? He asked, his brows furrowing for one second before clarity brightened within them, but still his serious visage remained as he said, are those the? Edith glasses, yeah, Peter confirmed as he turned them over in his hands, looking down at them. They were just on the floor? Quentin asked, his brows raised in disbelief at Peter's carelessness and Peter frowned and looked at the other man, yet another disappointment for himself swelling in his gut. But before the feeling could fester, Beck's expression cleared before he gestured to the glasses with one hand and said, try them on. Let's see how they look on you. Yeah? 
Peter asked. Yeah. Peter looked down toward the glasses in his hands as he unfolded the temple components away from the frame before he lifted it up to his face and pushed them up his nose, settling them there. Then, he turned fully to face Mr. Beck, waiting for his inspection on how they looked on him. But Beck didn't say anything. He just stared at Peter, studying him, enough for Peter to start to squirm under his scrutiny as he felt the need to fill the silence, saying in a slightly uncertain voice, I actually really like them. But the expression that he got back in response could only be described as incredulous. Can I be completely honest with you? Quentin asked slowly, carefully. Please. Quentin paused for only a second more, before he blurted out with his stoic expression still in place, they look really stupid. Disappointment rushed through him. Oh. Beck's brow scrunched inward as he continued to study him, then said, but maybe they have a contact lens version? Then he shrugged and reached for his beer, taking a swig of the brown ale. Peter reached up and swiped off the glasses from his face and then handed them out to Quentin. You try them on. A split second passed before a disbelieving laugh escaped Beck as he immediately began to wave Peter off. Oh, come on. Try them on, Peter insisted with a nod of his head. Quentin was laughing a bit more now as he shook his head in denial at him. I don't want to try them on. Just put them on, Peter urged, a bit more persistence in his tone. Quentin paused, hearing how much Peter wanted him to do this in his voice, his smile faltering just the slightest bit as he gave in. Taking the glasses gingerly in hand between his pointer finger and thumb, Beck slid them up his own nose, settled them on his face, and flashed Peter a look that silently asked him what he thought. Peter's vision honed in. And for a moment, he was fifteen again, sitting in front of Mr. Stark in his lab as he jibed and quipped with Peter on whatever crossed his mind. How had Peter never noticed before? The similarities between the two men were uncanny. And as if to further the image in his mind, Beck went on to say, What do you think, kid? Finally, Peter was able to tear his gaze away from what looked to be a ghost before him and down toward his lap, his mind bustling with so many thoughts at once as he tried to work through them. For the next Tony Stark, I trust you. He finally muttered to himself. Then, louder, he repeated, for the next Tony Stark. I trust you. What? Peter lingered on the thought for a couple of seconds, his mind calculating, before he peered up at Mr. Beck. Mr. Stark left me a message with those glasses, for the next Tony Stark, I trust you. Beck leaned forward slightly, a confused and incredulous expression on his face. I'm still confused. How many of those lemonades have you had? He knew every mistake I ever made, Peter said, his voice in earnest, okay? So he must have known that I was not ready for something like this. Then why would he give it to you? Beck asked. Because maybe he didn't trust me to have Edith. He just trusted me to pick who should. The more that he thought on this, the more it all made sense. Mr. Stark always felt a level of guilt whenever he had involved Peter in anything remotely dangerous. So why would he trust him with a system as extensive as Edith? It makes so much more sense, Peter said in a rush, he always knew that I'd do what's right and he's not going to give them to Fury because Fury would just give himself Edith. Beck sighed as he nodded. You're probably right about that. Right. So, the world needs the next Iron Man, someone to defend the Earth from world-level threats, and it's not going to be me. I'm just a 16-year-old kid from Queens. It needs to be an adult. With some experience, and that's good like Tony Stark like you. Quentin stared at him for half a second before he was immediately shaking his head and began taking off the glasses he still wore. No. Peter, come on. No. With another resolute shake of his head, Quentin set the glasses on the bar in front of Peter as he added another, no. But undeterred, Peter grabbed the glasses and quickly put them onto his face. Edith? He asked. Hello Peter, came the warm female robotic voice. Hi. Yeah, um, Peter greeted back distractedly as he shifted in his seat, facing forward so that he no longer had to look at Quentin's face as he said the next words, I'd like to transfer your control over to Quentin Beck. Peter what are you doing? Mr. Beck implored as he leaned closer in his seat with an underlying tone of disbelief there. Doing the right thing, Peter murmured. Any transfer will require confirmation, Edith spoke into his ear. Stark gave you the glasses Beck tried to argue in a surge of determination, his hand movement in the air trying to drive the point in further. 
Stark gave me a choice, Peter said passionately as he turned to face Quentin once again, it's my choice to make, okay? And I'm going to make it. The expression on Beck's face still didn't look convinced. Look, Peter pressed, you're a soldier, a leader. You stopped the elementals. You saved my life, you saved the world, okay? Peter exclaimed as his hand gestured toward the window, indicating to the world beyond. None of this would be here right now if it wasn't for Mysterio. He'd want you to have them. Waiting for confirmation, Edith rang in his ears. Confirm, Peter said, resolute. And with that one word. He already felt a huge weight lift up off his shoulders. The burden felt so much lighter as he took off the glasses and handed them over to a gobsmacked Mr. Beck who handled them with care and gentle fingers. Welcome to the Avengers, Peter said, all the weight behind the meaning of those words seeping through his tone. Because Peter very well may be looking at the face of the man who was going to lead the Avengers through victory after victory. Slowly, Mr. Beck raised the glasses and placed them back onto his face, giving Peter that look again, only this time it didn't hurt so much. There was a level of comfort there, a part of his mind tricking itself into seeing Mr. Stark before him. They look good on you, Peter said sincerely. Slowly, a gentle smile lit up Quentin's face as he reached forward and grasped Peter's hand in his for a firm handshake. Thank you, he said, his tone earnest, it's an honor. Yeah, Peter said quietly before he reached up to scratch at the back of his head, standing as the bar stool scraped against the floor, Mr. Stark would have really liked you. Beck smiled but didn't comment on that. Instead he asked, where you headed? A slight smile tickled at Peter's lips, basking in all of the sudden freedom he now had awaiting him. I'm gonna go find MJ. To assure her that he was all right before he would kiss her senseless. They really did have all the time in the world now, didn't they? Good luck with everything, kid, Quentin said, his eyes sparked with a knowing glint that had Peter flushing slightly. Right, Peter released in a breathy laugh. Then, with a little wave of his hand at the man he was sure would accomplish many more great things, Peter began to make his way for the door as he called over his shoulder, See you later, man. See you. And as Peter turned the door, he turned to give one last look at the man, only to find him watching Peter leave with a fond look on his face, his eyes gentle beneath the glasses that belonged there. Peter shut the door behind him, rest assured that he made the right decision, as he walked off into the night. Looking forward to celebrating with his girlfriend tonight in a completely different way than he just spent with Mr. Beck. A.N. Done. 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 And so begins the villainous rise of Mysterio. I looked at my notes, and this marks the one-year anniversary of when I picked up writing this story again. I was stuck on chapter 10 for a few years. But now look at where we are. 58 chapters and counting. Craziness. Only 100 more to go. Just kidding. It won't be that many more chapters. I think it's safe to say that with just this story alone, I basically wrote two novels this year, if you go by word count. That doesn't include the 11 book fantasy series that I'm also writing. So, overall, I feel that I had a very productive year. Can you post in the comments about what you are proud of that you accomplished this year? I would love to hear about it. Smile. Thank you so much for your love and loyalty to this story. Everyone has always been so kind to me and I just want to let you know how much I appreciate my readers. I will post an update on my Twitter of when I will begin writing the next chapter. Please leave a comment below and thanks so much for reading. Less than 3